Hello. Oh, it's a full house. That's nice. So I'm Thierry. I'm the curator of the exhibition. It's nice to see uh, everybody here, young people, to study. Do you all study uh, photography or you arts, everything? <laughs> photography. Oh, good. Well, so we'll have a mix uh, of everything. So it's a pleasure for me to be here uh, today. Um, you know, it's my second exhibition with uh, Constal in Rotterdam. I love so much the team and also uh, the museum is very dynamic with their programming and very diverse. Uh, maybe some of you have seen the Jean-Paul Gaultier exhibition three years ago. Anyone? Uh, okay, everyone. <laughs> so I curated that exhibition uh, back in uh, 2011, which I worked two years on, and then three years ago, uh, I met Peter uh, Lindbergh many years ago, and I was always obsessed by his work because for me, he's really in his own category, and he really has a, you know, a strong message in his work, and he's very unique with what he brings, not only to photography or to fashion, but also to art. And what I was most interested in was uh, the humanism in his images and also all these different universes. So it was quite interesting when I came to him and said, oh, I'd love to, to create something with you, an exhibition, a book. And he's someone who's really open-minded. He, he collaborated with so many different people from the beginning of his career until now that I grouped the exhibition in different uh, teams. Uh, for the book, it was presented in a different way. But uh, that's things we'll discuss about his inspirations and about uh, all his work. But for me, it was quite important to learn about the process of his work and how he became who he is now after all these years. So I hope you'll enjoy in the exhibition to discover all the different universes of, uh, of Peter and also all the humanity that you can find in his work. You know, the, you obviously see that there's a, uh, you know, this communication with his subjects and how you can even have your own idea and your own perspective and your own vision. And that's why the exhibition is titled A Different Vision on Fashion Photography. It's to show that you don't have to necessarily do only fashion to be uh, considered a great photographer and you can develop so many other uh, ways of photographing and to create your own uh, signature images. So I'll discuss all of this. But I really, really need you to welcome, super warmly, Peter Lindbergh. Take it easy. <laughs> so first time I came, um, you know Peter, he uh, uh, is born in Germany. Do we say the year or not? It was not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> no, he used to, uh, to spend some summer holidays uh, in, the, in the Netherlands, so it was quite Ironic, in fact, that the exhibition, you know, because it's, it's going to tour, it's initiated and produced by Kunsthal. And uh, Emily, you know, when we discussed this project the, the first time, she was so enthusiastic. And then Peter immediately said, oh, but I love the Netherlands. The, the beaches really left a big impact uh, on your More work. precise. <laughs> Nordwijk and Sandford. Very close to this book. <laughs> So what, you were just uh, spending all your holidays with your family here? Uh, My parents have drove from this book to Sanford, not it was about two hours, two and a half hours, on the weekends, and then we went to the beach. My father took the seats out of the car after the war, the not Mercedes or something, put the seats on the beach, and then they were sitting, my mother and my father were sitting like this on the beach in a car seat, and behind there was like this kind of the windbreaker, the same as today, and the boys were playing ball. That was the weekend. But then what type of uh, kid were you? Because I'm sure many of you as students or you know, not students, you want 
you know, to learn how, how you become Peter Lindbergh. What kind of childhood did you have? Did you have like parents who were into arts or into uh, photography? God, no, no. I have seen the first book when I was 14, I think. And that was, we had in our family, we had a subscription with Bertelsmann because these people, they came on, on the door and they talked you into becoming an intellectual. When you order like four books a, a, a year and they come like every season, the book comes this big, like something totally stupid. And then, so they were standing in a little shell, no hanging, in a little shell on the wall. And the shell was like this, not because they were very heavy and nobody ever touched them. And so that was my cultural education and my example. And I've never seen anything, I have to say. Never anything, not, not a image, not nothing, not really a desert. And that was very good because then when you get something to see, then you really see it. No? And I dragged my kids in the Louvre every morning, every, every, not every morning, every Sunday morning in Paris and the poor kids, they run after me like, oh, oh, not like this. And I was, this is the Joconde. You see how she looks and how beautiful the eyes. And they were like, <sighs> yeah. No, this was, that was, that was, I tried. And, and uh, in a way, it worked because one of them is a really good photographer. And they're, they're all the three very, very good. So in, somehow it worked. But in my case, that was very different. There was nothing. Because just to put in context, so you're born in 1944 in Nisa, uh, which was back then in Poland, and I guess after the war there was no access to arts. Your family was just artistic or not at all? No, no, nobody was artistic. My mother was a, a hidden artist, but she never expressed herself. It never got to that point. And, um, but she was carrying that idea in herself, and I think that's why um, I'm what he called Peter Lindbergh, and I still try to find out what that is. But I mean, so because uh, then uh, one of uh, this is one thing that I thought was fascinating because one of his first job was to be a window dresser. Uh, can you tell us what inspired yeah. you about window dressing? This fantasy of doing these windows. My father was more liberal in that moment. That was a very good moment. My mother, also being an artist and dreaming about being a singer, which she, at the end of her life was, a little bit, and, and, and she wanted me to become carleur. What is that in English? Um, the guys who put the tiles in your bathroom. Highly interesting. And, and, and I didn't want to be that. And in our street, there was one house, and that, that guy was the richest guy in the street, and his house was all white with tiles, the most ugly house. But it was prestigious. Now, after the war, you have a house in white tiles. That was amazing, amazing. And so my mom said, this is thing for you. You should do that. No? And I was like, what? No. And I, but I didn't know anything, really. So what I saw was when we went to Duisburg, because I was in Duisburg, but I, was left, I, I lived in Rheinhausen, that is the other side from the Rhine, and that is, now it's integrated, it's all called Duisburg. And when I went to Duisburg, the big city, and I saw in the big, like, Karstadt Hall and those big department stores, and I saw these guys in these windows, and they were, they were all the first fashionable thing what I saw, though, that little difference, no? I was really flabbergasted because they, they looked like fashion a little bit, no? What I'm not interested in today, but then neither. But it was for me. It was the same thing like art, or like 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 narrow pants, and art was all the same thing for me at this time. And that's why it became because my father said, "Let the young do what he wants." No. Yeah. yeah. So I, I guess that doing windows was probably what developed your artistic because it was in 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 a way the only. Uh, way that you could approach, in a way, your artistic side and to develop it. Yeah, I can't say something because I was a great revolutionary in this time because there was, they had coats, no? Blue and green, never together. What can be a reason for that? That's the most stupid thing. And so what I learned is not how to do composition or something about art is, I learned how stupid people can be by refusing something. How can you refuse blue and, and like, don't put blue 
and green together. And I was like, why? It doesn't, don't do it. No? And I did it. No? And then I get, I was in trouble for this. I put a little blue thing behind a green shoe. And I said, okay. <laughs> and then the guy came and said, what the hell is this? No, and I was finished. Like. <laughs> but then, in, uh, so you traveled a bit uh, because your hero was uh, Vincent Van Gogh. Van Gogh. Uh, and you traveled to Arles, you went to Spain, and you traveled a bit. And then after that, you enrolled uh, the Berlin Academy. And, uh, no, that's the other way. Terry, you didn't do your homework. No, that, <laughs> no it was maybe switched into biography. I went from this book, I had to go to the military service, and funny enough, that was in Holland. There was a station, what it was, NATO or something already, I don't know. But I had to go somewhere in Holland to my military service. So I said, military service? Me? No. So I went to Switzerland. I, how do you say, I left Germany. I went to Switzerland, and eight months, it's my, it's Stefan here, my assistant. Ah, yeah. yeah. Because he's Swiss, so I don't want to say what happened. It was really boring. And I had to go somewhere else. And I went to Berlin from there. And there, everything started. You know? in, in Berlin, everything really started. It was the first time I saw a museum, or a gallery, or, or uh, there was a time of happenings and, and a metro or, and all this kind of stuff. And that was really, really exciting. And I got sucked it up like a, a sucker, I guess. <laughs> But anyway, but and then, before you say it wrong again, and then from there, I wanted to go to the Academy of Arts. And so and I, 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 I wrote myself in, I did evening courses, worked at night, and then went in the afternoon to school and tried to be an artist. No? And when I really want to enroll, you say that, in, on the Academy, they said, okay, the first two, two years is like, drawing after the nature. Uh, we have to want to be, if you want to be an artist, you have, first thing you have to do is you have to, have to draw after the nature, like perfect. I was like, and very fast I figured out that that you don't have to do, you know, because Picasso, I don't think he have this drawing microphone like a Japanese artist or something. And then um, from, from there, I figured out this is not the right thing. And I said to the, to the teacher, you know, I just don't think I have to do that. And I'll go to Arles now, because I was really a fan of Van Gogh, no? and the violence he had. No, I, was, I was really, I was totally adapted to this, uh, addicted to look at those Van Gogh portraits and everything. And then I went to Arles, and that's where Terry is coming now. <laughs> so it's just a little switch, no? No, but I'm more interested in knowing, uh, for example, in school, when you enrolled school, did you consider yourself at that time before starting your uh, art classes, did you consider yourself creative or it was just something you wanted to explore or you had the, already an idea that you wanted to be a painter or you wanted maybe to be a sculptor or just to study it? Did you have something in mind uh, then? Yeah, yeah, because when I, when I went from, from Berlin, that was before the art school, I went to, to, to Arles, and then from Arles, there was no, there was no plan, there was no plan, it was time, timeless, I just was like, went to Arles, and then from Arles, after eight months, I left, and I went um, to down the, the, the east side of Spain, to Morocco, and everything, hitchhiking, and that took, at the end, two years, no? And this is something I can only, um, um, emphasize that something really, really great. And that was a very, very important time. And today people don't do that anymore. No? Because I think your mother would say, what, Two, where do you want to go? No, you have to do the course, now you want to become this. Everything's lined up, there's no break and nothing. So and that while everybody becomes a bit the same too. No? So you know, if everybody has the same, the same education, then you do a job and then you do the next job and then you come up to get like, a little bigger job and then a bigger job, you get a get nice car and everything and then and at the end you have really no idea why you're there, you know? Mm. But then in school, do you consider that what you learned uh, was necessary? Is there, in fact, did it help you to figure out that it was not what you wanted to do? Because at some point uh, in 69, uh, even as a student, you were invited to do this exhibition at Hans Meyer 
gallery because you were a conceptual artist. Yeah, but the art school in Krefeld, that was when I came back after two years and I was like, I looked like I was not usable anymore for the world. And then my family, they, they faked something. They said, you know, your brother is putting up his apartment. He just married you. He needs some help. So just to get me there and to Düsseldorf. So I was in Düsseldorf and I helped him. And then I said, you know, there's a great art school. You want to go to art school? There's a great art school in Krefeld. And there was a great art school. And I went there. And that was a fantastic time. And there I learned a lot. And what I learned there was you have to do it yourself. You can learn nothing. No, you can learn finally. I think you can learn nothing in school. You can only be there and you have it like four years of time or three years of time. And in these three years, you can develop who you are, but you don't expect that somebody tells you something. And I have to say, they were like my, my, my teacher, was Professor Kirchberger a painter from south of Germany, but he was teacher there. He never talked to me in four years about what I did. Never. So, and that was really great because they don't want to disturb a genius in the making, I guess. But it was really, I mean, I learned a lot because I learned that that's nobody tells you, yo, but you do this, do this, and then compose this and that, because that would be awful, because it would be not you. Um, but then the conceptual art you were doing, because they were called uh, monotypes, uh, they were exhibited, even they were exhibited uh, in 2014 in the uh, Tengli Museum, in uh, conceptual, uh, yeah. because your heroes were like Joseph Kossuth, uh, Joseph Beuys. This came really sudden, very sudden, because I was like, I mean, I, maybe they didn't talk to me because I was the only one walking in school, <laughs> to say there were a lot of people, but they were all like having fun. And I was really working. And um, at one point, there came a gallery, came to school, and for like a speech or something, and they saw the work, and they said, um, what, you want to have an exhibition? And yeah, and so we did an exhibition in Hans Meyer Gallery. In the Hans Meyer's gallery was a really, really up and avant-garde gallery. And that was, un I mean, unbelievable shock for everybody especially for the teachers, they were all yellow. And then... And his name was Sultan back then. Yeah, you know, I have to excuse myself, I, I was playing around with names. Uh, Sultan, isn't that ridiculous? And that happened because there was an exhibition when I was on school before, a year before this, and they did the catalogue. That was in Recklinghausen, the little museum kind of, they met the young Germans, no? And I was supposed to be in there, and I was in there, and I was on the telephone for the catalog with the guy, and he said, so Peter, um, 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 what, is your, what is your name, your artist's name? And I promised, it sounds like stupid, but it's, I really promised, I was on the phone, and I said, um, <clears throat> Peter, so, um, uh, uh, Sultan, no? <laughs> I said, ah, yeah, yeah, sure, okay, thanks. <laughs> and, I, and I was Sultan. No really clue why or why. I said, it was ridiculous. And I was then Sultan for a few years, no? <laughs> Speaking of uh, early years, and uh, I'm sure many of you are wondering what you're going to do or what you want to do, uh, we received uh, one portfolio from Jessica Borstra, excuse me, my uh, pronunciation in which uh, Jessica is here, in which uh, you explain, uh, to be honest, I'm still searching for the thing I want to tell you with my photos. Could you please come with us? I'd like to discuss with you. Can you please welcome Jessica? <laughs> Jessica had a great courage in her statements, no? Hi. Nice to meet you. Hi. Ciao, Jessica. Okay. So, where do you study? At Bill McConing, in Rotterdam. Okay. Yeah. And you still don't know what you... No, I'm only second year, second year, so I'm still searching for the thing I want to do, I don't know yet. If no. you would, it would be awful. <laughs> <laughs> because once you know what you do, what you want to do, then 
You're done, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was so, I so great that I told that I was really flippergasted. I said, whoa, this is someone who really had fought the right thing. I just say, I don't know, I just do it, and then we see what's going to happen. Yeah. You know, and then next year I do something else, probably, or I don't know. Something. And people normally, they try to find that very early, which is mostly a pity, no? Mm -hmm. and, then, and then keep on going until they die, no? <laughs> so that was very refreshing to read this. Shall I say something of it? To be honest, I'm still searching for the thing I want to tell with my <laughs> photos. Me too, I tell you. <laughs> yeah. What else? Until my last quarter, I didn't really work with the concept, but I did with my last work. So yeah. you're approaching hmm? the end then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to focus more mainly on uh, photography or you're open, uh, like Peter who went from conceptual artist to photography, is it something that you're open to uh, change? Um, I don't think so, no. No, I did, it's really um, Yeah, I did uh, styling um, school first and then you also draw and make things and, but it didn't, it's my, I can't really do that, I'm not good at that, so. It's not my thing. <laughs> so you know you're good at it because your pictures uh, that you see on the, the other page, I don't know if we can see some images. Can we? Oh, yeah. Actually, this was my second shoot I did. So this was the first time I was really in the studio. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And how do you work in terms of, uh, do you have any role models, inspirations? Uh, like the work of Nick Knight. And in this, in this uh, philosopher that I also like a lot. Um, what about Peter? Oh, yeah, I that was. Yeah. See, I want to say it myself. Uh, also I your guess work. it's me. <laughs> no? No, I'm joking. No. Yeah. You say something. You say something. The last sentence. You say, "I love to do portraits. I think that's something beautiful that people let you in close to them, more than without a camera." Yeah. So you had bad experience <laughs> in a normal life. No. Yeah, yeah, well, if you have a camera, you can come closer to someone um, and they accept that you come close with your camera and think that's a, a special thing if you are a photographer that you really can see the person inside, yeah. That's the most beautiful thing, yeah. I think, yeah, for me too. And what I figured out in like the hundred years I'm doing this, it's like, I always thought that you, that you photograph the person, I mean, Mm -hmm. That's what you see, no? Yeah. And I figured out that it's very, very different because on a certain level you come to something which is not, they don't let you in, mm -hmm. they mix with you. Yeah. And that mix is not this and it's not this or not this and not this, it's what is between you, no? And that is what, what you have, to, what you should develop, what, what develops, no? When you think they let you in close, no? that, mm -hmm. that something develops, and that's what you photograph. And that person, which is like not really existing, it's a mix of what you think about that person and what that person thinks about you. Yeah. And that's why it's important to have that really, really, um, um, to get to come to a certain relationship. And that is the most interesting thing. That's mm -hmm. I mean, that is it. I get goosebumps when I. Say that. <laughs> Do you have a question? For you? Um. And, and, and that person, the both that you create, that goes so far that you can transform a face. No? Yeah. That's, it's incredible. I, I was sometimes shocked. No? So, and then people say, that it's really him. No? That's all bullshit. No? You can't photograph a person no? with one picture. But you can photograph that moment no, you had with that person. And that is beautiful. And so all the portraits are all the beautiful moments you had with these people. And that's very intimate. Yeah. And when you put the camera down, that person disappears. No? If you want to make notes, it's no problem with me. It's OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really don't have a question, I think. <laughs> no, 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 sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. Thank you, Jessica. Great. Yeah? Yeah. Thank you. That's great to be so open. Very good. Great to be so open. It's beautiful. So speaking of um, inspirations and finding your your path, uh, I think one thing that uh, inspired you also and uh, 
One day you were mentioning Simon, uh, your son, who's uh, also an artist, uh, Broadbeck and the Barbier. You should look at uh, their work. It's quite nice, and they're at uh, Villa Medicis now in Rome. Uh, Last, before yesterday, he went to the Villa Medicis for one year. That's a really big thing in France, no? And one day he asked you, I think it's quite an interesting question, he asked Peter, why did you choose fashion photography? Yeah, I guess I came home from something complaining that, God, these guys, they didn't get it, or they pushed me to do this and this I didn't want to do. And then he said, why did you start with fashion photography, Pops? And I said, there was nothing else, no? Yeah, I could have done art photography, no? Because he's an, he's, he comes from the art side to photography, no? And um, he couldn't believe it. I said, there was no art photography, no? There was no, no ghost keys, and there were no people like that. And so fashion was the most, the freest kind of photography uh, when I started, like a oh, long time ago. And that was very uh, discovering for him. He, had, he, didn't, he didn't know that, no? It was the, the most accessible, because you were inspired a lot by, uh, but not inspired, but you were looking uh, at images, uh, you know, from Dorothy Lange, you know, all the Farm Security Administration uh, photographers, uh, August Sanders and Diane Arbus, for you, where you were more inspired by photojournalism than actual fashion photography. It's not like you were looking, you were more into arts and into um, subjects and images with soul. Yeah, but I also was inspired, or I, I liked a lot, like, the early Avedon pictures and, and, and the pen pictures and kind of the mainstream uh, um, photography. But then there was something missing, you know? And then I thought, if you put Dine Arbus and Irving Penn in a mixer, that is something you could live with, you no? Know? And um, Dine Arbus was always for me like a kind of a... Um, if, you know, if you look at something you did and you say, wow, how is it? No, you have to edit already then. And then you think about Dan Arbus and you say, okay, no, waste basket. So that is kind of a very, you always have, I think you have to have something like this which guides you, no? And that can be another photographer or the history of fashion, photo or of history of photography, or later, becomes yourself who judge that, no? And that is a very nice, um, um, a very nice process, no? Because before, earlier, you need something to justify what you do, and to place yourself wherever you want to be placed. And then later, that becomes, the more you have that process of, of doing things, the more you, 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 you become important in your own work. And that is a very interesting point, no? Because then, then you can do that yourself, so everything you do relates to yourself, no? And it's not I'm me, myself, and I, it's rather the opposite, no? And that is very interesting. I mean, you come to that point, then things get more complicated, but also more easy, no? On the different levels, no? And, and in that context, a most important thing to, I mean, you're mostly all photographers. Yeah, no? They're shy. Who is not photographer? <laughs> God, hell! <laughs> no. <laughs> no, because, because the most, if you photographer, you whatever you are, it doesn't matter. No? It's like if you, if you do something or you, you be creative or you want to be creative or you, do, you want to be the designer, photographer, anything. No? It's like the most important thing is you find that place in you from where you find your inspiration. No? And, and, and it motivates you. And when I was in art school, and I stopped at the end of the art school, because the work I was doing was very nice, I was very happy with myself, and then the American artists walked in my world, like Kossuth, Weiner, all these concept artists, and they were so brilliant, and they were so far ahead of all that I knew from art, so that I just could say, wow, you're not existing anymore, Peter. And I said, that's, too fast and too many things, I got to stop. No? So I stopped my work, it was very successful, no? because I tried to adapt a little bit, and when I tried to adapt to the concept artist with the stuff I was doing, that was possible too, and it was very interesting. But I felt that there is something 
what was not me anymore. And I'm really very grateful for that because I see a lot of people who don't, they, they didn't never get to that moment. So that where you know where you are, where it's you and what you really know about you, and then maybe what you want to be, what you are not. And then you have to feel that when that separates, no? Then you have to make a decision, no? And I just said, I stop. I, I can't do that, and I stop to find what that is again. And, and that was a very, very good uh, um, decision to have that feeling. And then when that happened, um, after like six, eight months doing nothing, just thinking about what I want to be, and that doesn't really work, I have to say. So somebody came and said, Peter, you sit around for like eight months now. You want to, that's, that's a friend of mine who uh, needs an assistant. I said, what is he doing? Photographer. And, and that's how I became a photographer. So it's not kind of, God, this man has been chosen from God to be for the first day a photographer. Not at all. So it could have been really accidentally. And then I was assistant. And at this time, assistant is very different from today. It's much more complex today. From that moment, I was like three weeks there. And I know that is it, no? Do you consider it's important uh, to be uh, an assistant and to do internships and to learn from uh, experience with other people? Yeah, not, I don't know. I don't know. Um, you got the answer. Stefan, <laughs> Stefan, can you stand up? You should have seen my assistant. Stefan, see? Stefan Rapon, the yeah. first assistant of Peter. Is it great to be assistant? See, well, it's fun. good answer. Speaking of uh, of inspiration and Jean, uh, we got this uh, email also from uh, Liz Marie Schwander. Is Liz Marie here? Yeah. Where? Oh, can you please come here? <laughs> I guess I'm embarrassing. I don't know if you knew that I would call you to come here. I hope I don't embarrass anyone. You shouldn't have sent an email. That's There's your three more to come. <laughs> because the moment you do something, like saying something, making a painting, a photograph or something, or write in mail, you're traceable. Yeah, and <laughs> see what happens, no? <laughs> Hi, Liz Marie. Hi. Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, It's over. So, Kid? where are you from? I'm from Rotterdam. Oh, yeah. nice. And what you, where do you study? Uh, Willem de Koning Academy. Well, good, good, good. <laughs> In the um, portfolio you sent us, you say, the subject I choose should determine their own genre, which I think was a nice quote, even for Peter, because, you know, he doesn't paint himself into one style, and I think you can develop your own style, and I think you're right when you see that the subject you choose determines the genre. Peter went from yes, dance yes, yes, to, uh, you know, UFOs to different subjects which yeah. develop the genre. What do you try to say with your uh, images which uh, Peter liked? Yeah, I want to uh, yeah, tell stories with my pictures, and uh, it's always a quiet, uh, heavy stories and yeah, most people I don't, I think most people don't want to see some pictures I make like this one. I don't, yeah, it's what quite. What did you say? Most people don't want to see like this one. Yeah, that doesn't it's, matter. No, no, no. I, I don't think so it's, as well. But yeah. That, that's a great thing if you think that. That's a good beginning too because if you start thinking. What, what you do should please someone, then that's a bad thing because you're not yourself anymore. Hmm? Yeah. That's today when, the, when people say the art market, so the artists are more free because they don't do commercial work. We had that discussion with Art Forum, that's a big discussion in the moment. Like, like um, the, uh, uh, how do you say in English, when somebody orders something, on, co on command, you do something on command, or you do it free. So artists are supposed to be free, and it's not the case at all because they're working for the art market. But nobody wants to be poor, nobody wants to be uh, uh, left behind. So they're all working for a market, you know? and so the market is the same thing. Then you have a client where you do something for, you know? 
and the difference between uh, uh, art supposed to be free and art to be asked for is uh, there's no difference, no? And that is just people start to understand that there's a big discussion going on. He knows things better like this. <laughs> no, because for you, Peter, uh, freedom, liberty of expression is something that is always present in your work and you know, never followed, for example, the trends or what it is what an image is supposed to be, how it should be politically correct. Mm -hmm. And that's what is interesting, I think, in your portfolio is this idea, as you say, the word liberty um, is something that is very important to you. What do you think, Peter, that uh, freedom, liberty is, uh, is the main... Yeah, I, uh, I, like, I like what you said because you were saying more or less like, you know, I do that picture and then I do that picture. It doesn't have to be connected in a way, no? Right. I just do yeah. a picture and that's my picture and tomorrow I do something else. And why should that connect? No? That's a great yeah, point. Yeah, but uh, at Art Academy, you always have to... I feel pressure, like um, you have to be uh, a special photographer or you have to say something else than all mm. the others. And it was very difficult to, oh, yeah. to <laughs> think <laughs> what? Well, you already have your yeah. own style. Yeah, but <laughs> what is it? Right. You put pressure yourself, no? I don't know, you should not think that way. I think you should just think what you want to do. No? You see something, you do it, and then... There's a, there's a, there's a teacher in, in Paris, an, an old German Jewish teacher, he's like 90 old now, and Coach Stern, and he's a school for paintings now. So I had I went with my kids there uh, um, uh, 30 years ago, Often, I uh, once a week, and and the, the idea. So you you can go there, I can go there, the kid can go there. There were there were there were kids like five years old, all the same things. They have one A3 size of paper. If you want to do bigger, you can do two or four, put them together on the wall, and then all the vertical on the wall, and you paint. And the, in the middle of the walls is like a long table with like water and everything. But the point is that they learned to do that for themselves. That was the whole point of the school. The parents, they had no, they picked the kids up, and beside the kid was five years, was a guy who was like 75 years old, and, and do something, no? And it was so interesting, and I did a book with him, or he did a book with me, he asked me to do some pictures. Um, um, and that was incredible. And the parents, under no circumstances, no? They had the right to see the, what the kids were doing. The door was closed, they had to wait in the waiting room, and the kids came out of the closed door. I mean, the door opened, for, hmm? mm. but not this door, because the two doors, you could never look in that room. And that is to learn that what you do, you do it for yourself. No, and today, when you see that, I mean, I have to say, I'm a little more relaxed too with this. Now, when some, one of the kids paints something, oh my God, beautiful, Robert, it's so nice. It's, that's terrible, no? Because maybe it's not nice, no? And yeah. if it's nice, then don't say it, because that is for them they should do that. And that's what the whole meaning of the school was that. You do it for you. That's a great um, point. Yeah. I could have said it shorter, I know. <laughs> because uh, one thing that is important to point out, you know now uh, with social medias, uh, with uh, Facebook, Instagram, it's much easier to promote your own work, whatever you do. Um, and, you know, in the 70s, you didn't have internet or Facebook or Twitter and all these tools that you have now which you know is very global and when you um, I know that as young uh, artist or a young person or not even young if you want to try something there's always this fear of uh, rejection um, Peter yes <laughs> speaking of uh, fear of rejection did it happen to you sometimes to have Images rejected or clients that was, were saying, oh, this is that bad. That's very funny because that is like um, very little, very little. Because I always knew if it was good or not good. So if something is good and somebody said, I have a great good story to tell. When somebody said, I did a story for American Vogue in 1988. No? And that was a bit totally against the rule because that was a that's five or six women in white shirts on the beach, no? And, and, and they became accidentally after the supermodels. But the point was that 
I, American Vogue wanted me to work for the magazine, and I was in Europe, and so I, I went to New York and talked to the people, and they said, you know, our editors tell us that you always say no when they want to book you, and what's wrong with you? You know what we are, American Vogue, huh? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I know. But, um, so they said, um, so what is your problem then with us? And I said, it's nothing to do with you, it's just the woman in your magazine I can't photograph something like that, no? Um, they are all rich, that was the first thing. Nothing against rich. I don't spit in my own thing today. <laughs> and, and they were, and they were, they, they, they lived through their social, how do you say, the social, they were very interested in, in the social thing. They had beautiful life, cars and everything. Everything had to be perfect. And I liked the woman in art school, you know, because they had t-shirts on and jeans, but they know why they were in art school, because they wanted to do something, you know, and they were interesting, and they were funny, and they're not living through a crocodile bag for $75,000. Believe it or not, that's what it costs today, you know? A crocodile bag from some companies. <laughs> <coughs> Thanks, you. And, 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 and I couldn't, I, I have no fantasy, you no know, inspiration with this. And then, and then they said, but then why don't you go somewhere? And you take the woman you like, kind of, and, um, and then show us what it is. No? And take an editor, whatever you want, and go wherever you want. No? And, and I took that very, uh, uh, very literal, and I took an editor from them, and I said, you know, it's all about the woman. You don't have to bring any clothes. Bring like t shirt or white shirts or something like this, and we go to LA and we shoot it on the beach. And then we came back with the pictures. And they were thinking I would do an American book story like it was at the time, no? just with the fresh faces or something. So I, I was very not proud, even I was just like, hello, here. Yeah. No? I was very happy. That was really what I had in my mind. And, and they were like, what the hell is this? What do you want to do with this? I don't know. You asked me, I said, you asked me to go and show you what it is. So that is it. No? And they were like, all right. Um, Thank you very much. No, bye bye. No? So, and I didn't hear anything from it. So the pictures were in a waste basket. And then Anna Winter came, who is the editor in chief now from, from Vogue. And six months later only, and the other editor had to go home. And Anna came in there, and Anna saw the pictures. Yes, I didn't say fire, this is not nice. See? <laughs> and then and, and Anna saw the pictures and said, Christ's sake, I would have given you the cover and 20 pages. So, and that, that, that's not even not finished the story. And then, um, that was 88. February 88, we shot it. August 88 was Anna, Anna's first issue. And I did the cover for that issue, but it was not these pictures, no? And then, um, 92, four years later, Vogue did a book called On the Edge. That's a little, no, or whatever. And on the edge, 100 years of American Vogue. And that picture with the white shirts on the beach was declared the most important picture of the decade of the 80s, no? That's kind of fun. That's, you see, what you have to think, what people say, think about your pictures, no? Yeah, because you get rejected and then they named it. Uh... Oh yeah, the whole thing in short is like, you know, I did something that was rejected and four years later it was the most important thing in the world. It was much shorter, no? but... <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thank you very much. Do I have the tendency to talk too much? Yes, I do. No, yeah. Both of Thanks us. Very much. Both of us. Thanks very much. We're keeping you for the afternoon with us. Um, one thing that uh, would be interesting to, to know is, uh, you know, some people really helped you out uh, at the beginning. For example, uh, Barbara Larcher from uh, Stern. Uh, who asked you to shoot for the magazine uh, back then where Helmut Newton and Guy Bourdin uh, were shooting. Um, is there many people you think that uh, have been key in your uh, development of your photographic career? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, sure, there was like Barbara Lacker was the first one. She, and they were still like doing advertising and some not so incredible things. And then, then somebody asked me to do kind of fashion story for something. 
and I did it for a little magazine, I don't even know the name anymore, and they were quite different, and then Barbara from Stern saw that, and Stern did like twice a year, a fashion portfolio, like 14 pages, is a lot in the, in the magazine like this, and they were done for the last 10 years by either Helmut, Guy Baudin, or Hans Feuerer. No? And so, and then she saw that little thing somewhere, I don't know, in a waste basket somewhere, I guess, and said, and called me and said, hey, who are you? Well, the, come, to, come to Hamburg, I have something for you. So, and I, and I went to Hamburg, and, and she was sitting there, she was always speaking very unsophisticated. Went, what the fuck is this? It's fantastic, you know. You want to you wanna do the portfolio for us? I said, what portfolio? I said, the, 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 fashion, the Paris collections. I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> no. and, and, so, and, and I did it, and that was like the supermodel thing for the supermodels. When that came out, like the next day, like, like three magazines called from Paris, and Marie Claire and, from other, and said, you come to Paris, we give you a contract, no? So I went to Paris and get this contract from Marie Claire, and... But then, in a way, you're not following the rules uh, of fashion magazines because everybody was shooting in color uh, back then, but you were shooting in black and white. Was it a problem for some magazines where, when they were asking you to uh, shoot in color rather than black and white? Because for you, you always said uh, there was a notion inside of you that black and white was linked to truth and you really wanted to stick to it. Yeah, and somehow I got used to this, to believe that, and it's just something you tell yourself and then you start to believe it, but a lot of things are like this. Or what I always, what I saw as truthful, that were the, pic the pictures from the American photographers. Um, <laughs> for the American photographers, and they, they worked for the, um, uh, the agencies in America in the Great Depression, and they went, were sent in the country, all over the country, in America, to shoot, to, to document social problems like child labor and this kind of stuff. No? And, and then they went back to Washington and the senators there with their little beautiful suits, they were looking at them and they made the laws after their pictures. No? And, and these pictures are today but the most the world heritage of photography, they're really amazing. Like Walker Evans, Dorothea Long and all these people. And, and that's what I grew up with, no? I mean grew up with after Berlin or not later, no, not earlier, and then um, that for me was truthful, no? and that went so in my, in my mm, whatever, head or stomach, that I couldn't really believe that color is something, I thought color was always like a lie in a way, you know? like advertising is color, no? and they mostly lie about something, and then they make it nice in, in color, so because they want to sell you something. Yeah, you know? yeah. And so the black and white doesn't do that in a way, you know. And that's the proof was that they say, "No, nah, black and white, you can't do that in black and white." Yeah. And no? speaking of rules, um, we have uh, Ruth uh, Horstmanhoff is here. Can you please welcome Ruth? <laughs> So next Ruth? time, next time when you write mails or something, then sit closer here. They're all sitting <laughs> in the last <laughs> row. It's funny. Hi, <laughs> <I> was... <laughs> Nice to see you. Hi, welcome. Hi. Ruth was quite interesting because she sent uh, with, along with her portfolio, and she, you write rules can be comforting but also compelling and painful. Uh, I tried to isolate the influence of the role of the photo studio and the examine them subsequently. I think it's quite... Uh, do you feel comfortable doing this, not to follow the rules? Are you a uh, punk? A <laughs> punk? Well, not really, I think. But I'm just inspired by these, uh, these rules because we have so many things around us that we want to uh, behave people like something. And I just like uh, to... Uh, know how people are, um, how you can see these rules, how they uh, influence them. That's great, yeah, that is totally true. Because speaking of rules, Peter, uh, in your work, uh, in the exhibition, there's a room called Zeitgeist, and uh, there's a lot of political statements 
Uh, he witnessed many, uh, you know, for example, peace demonstrations in 68 mm -hmm. and the students' demonstration. There were some in Amsterdam, in Paris, in Berlin, all over the world. And, uh, you know, it's something that he likes to, to share. So I don't think that there's any rules that you can follow. You know, there's not like yeah. a perfect path to, to mm -hmm. follow. How do you work when you, uh, when you say that, you know, these rules for you are different? Do you feel that you're different when you shoot or...? No, well, I'm not a photographer. I'm, I'm doing this teacher um, uh, class, or how do you say it? Teaching what? Uh, what? Sorry? Teaching what? Uh, teaching art, yes. I worked in a museum ah, for a great. long time. Yeah. So we go out of photography, that's great. I'm yes. sorry? So we go out of the photography, that's great, because that's great. It's too much about photography. It's about yes. everything. I always see everything you yes, say. Yes, it's, it's not about, about <laughs> photography, no. Yes, because I, um, it's a coincidence that's a photo um, that I make. So it's not um, about photography, it's about rules. And it's all over, over interesting you know, because rules, is, it depends. You make the rules, even if there are no rules, there are always rules. There's no rules that doesn't exist no, because you want to be something, that's the first mm -hmm. rule. And you want to be that person, not that person. That's also how you dress. No? You want to be not mixed up with these people or with these people. No? Yeah. And then, and with your artwork, you know, if you do this instead of this, that is a rule too, then I'll be successful or more successful, less successful. No? And, and all this kind of thing, everything is guided by that. For me, it's like, for example, I work for American Vogue. I have to do color. I have to do, I have to be nice. Mm -hmm. The girls have to be beautiful in a, yeah. in a way that you can say, I mean, it's not that bad, but it's like much, much more different from working for an issue, for an, an more avant-garde Vogue, like Italian Vogue. So you'd be a different person, no? and a different person for that. But you can also say, I don't want to be different, so I only work for them. No? That's the choice. Yeah. No? And, then, yeah. and then you have no rules, but that's boring, not to. Is that what you want to say, a little bit? That is, that, that, that is boring to have uh, no rules. Yes, it's when interesting to have rules. No? Yes, when yeah. because it's yeah. interesting how people react on these rules and how you can express these rules from the inside of someone. Uh, for example, with uh, young people, uh, teenagers, they have a lot of rules, and um, we say that they have to behave like somehow they have to watch at people and to say thank you. But when you um, uh, you, you don't know how they, it will influence them. Yeah. So that's why I uh, printed this text revolution because it's from inside that it's going somewhere. And I, I'm really interested by this. Uh, Do you think things. that has changed from the time of the provost? Like, like, like the people today are like more living under rules and like they, they don't revolt as much as that was in the 60s. Or is that something? Well, I don't, I don't know because uh, I think that um, as a society you always have rules and these rules are very, uh, very strict but normally you, you think, especially in the art uh, school, you think uh, there are no rules but there are a lot yeah. <laughs> and uh, that's interesting to, to view, uh, to look at these rules. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. So you... Uh, and yourself, you live up to the rules or uh, you Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. See, that's <laughs> I don't. a good answer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's true Speak. because living after, I mean, living always after the rules is very, can be very limiting and live always against the rules is kind of limiting too, no? Because at, on both sides, you have to exclude a part of what exists, no? And then to be a revolution all the time, that's really, that must be very um, pain, painful, no? Because you have to say no to everything, no? And if you, like, have both of it, that's much easier and much more productive, maybe. Yeah, but speaking of rules, because you'll, you'll see in the exhibition, there's many images that were meant for uh, fashion magazines and you see the way they're cropped. Uh, one thing that is interesting, how do clients react sometimes when, for example, you did the Lanvin advertising campaign 
and he booked uh, Nadia Warman to do the advertising campaign, but all the pictures were cropped. Uh, you, you wouldn't see her face, and so many are just framed differently, and sometimes you don't even see the clothes. Um, it's difficult to tell people, um, you have to take a model, we have to pay a fortune, and they'll cut the head off. Because the whole thing was about like, like, like sculptures that she moved, that she moved very, very incredible. Nadia moves unbelievably great. But then they said, oh, that's great. If you want to do that and cut the head off, then we just take a, a model from whatever, no? from <laughs> out of the waste basket, like the worst one, because you don't show her. And I said, no, it's the opposite. We have to take the best one for that. So the, the bodies and the pictures are so, I mean, they're beautiful. They're beautiful. And, and, and that is, yeah. But how do you crop your uh, images? Do you crop directly when you um, shoot? Or oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I never crop after. Um, no. So I what, mean, you, what you see in your lens is the final result? Yeah, I, I always, always. That's depressing. But because I, I think that photog photography happens when you shoot in the camera in that moment, no? and not before and not after. And that's why I hate Photoshop and, and all this kind of stuff, because it's like, that's, don't feel like a photographer anymore. You just do some pictures, and then after you're going to sit there like three days and put the head from there to there. And out. That's really boring. No? So it's not photography anymore, because that, that moment when you, everything works together, and that is true for portraits like this close-up, or a scene with like explosions, 600 Martians running around, and you do that all in time and not in Photoshop. That's the whole, that's the whole beauty of what photography is this, no? And, and if you want to take that away with Photoshop for me, I would say no. <laughs> that's, that's so, that's so. Um, and the funny thing is, what I just said, that was okay, that came in my mind, that the same thing is for, for a close up. There's so many things happen when you do portrait, no? It's as wild than the biggest scene, no? And, yeah, it's the same thing. That's amazing. It's just speak sort of first time about it. <laughs> Speaking of um, fashion clients who sometimes complain that you don't see their clothes. Yeah, that's um, a good point. Great. We had um, also this email from Quint Verhardt. Quint? Oh. See and again. the back again. Yeah. <laughs> Please welcome Quint. <laughs> <laughs> Quint sent us in his uh, email something that was uh, quite funny. After your graduation, it's time to be serious. <laughs> you said after my graduation, graduation, it's time to be serious, to experiment, to discover, to develop, to create your own signature. Yeah, um, well, uh, to be on school now, it, you got your time to do whatever you want, you know, you, you have time to experiment with your things and uh, discover new silhouettes, uh, discover how to, um, yeah, with uh, different kinds of photographers, um, yeah, to make uh, different kind of things. Illustration man. Huh? illustration man. He's illustration man, he's illustrations. Yeah. Illustration, and uh, yeah, I'm a fashion designer at the uh, Willem de Kooning Academy. Funny. See, that's already a very good point, no? because you look like your pictures. <laughs> Do I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, great. Yeah, it's really great. I was, well, uh, yeah, you, you need to make your own signature, and by, uh, yeah, to experiment with all different kinds of things, all different kinds of shapes, all different kinds of color, textures, structures, um, yeah, that's how you create your signature, and that's why I think um, yeah, you need to be playful uh, on the academy now, because uh, now you can discover everything and uh, create your own um, your signature, and after the academy you can yeah, really uh, be serious and then uh, start the business. Are yeah. you okay with this, Peter, that you have to be <laughs> serious once you leave school? No, no, no. I want to ask him first one thing, <laughs> and I wanted to ask you is if you're mostly a photographer. Oh. Sorry? Because I want, you're mostly a photographer. You work with photography? Or illustrator or fashion designer? Uh, I have more fashion designer, yeah. More fashion? Yeah. It's because I wanted to ask you, how did this color get on your pants when you're not a painter? Also by myself. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is fashion. This yeah. is fashion. Um, yeah, I get my inspiration most of the time from or, uh, photographers, but most of the time uh, artists. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and it also was me uh, working on a project, so I just put off my pants uh, <laughs> and just painted it all. And yeah, it 
just uh, came out there. Good. <laughs> so that is originally done. Sorry? It's originally painted. Not yeah, by myself. Yeah. Good. But Thank I think you. it's uh, like, for example, Peter, as I was saying in the introduction, he has his own uh, signature. When I, when do you feel that you found your own signature? Do you think you're still looking for it? I think you have it, but when do you think, is there a moment you said, this is my style and I'll stick to it? No, that's, diff that's difficult, that's difficult because I, I always wanted to avoid uh, any cost not to have the one thing, no? Because the one thing might end, no? Because inspiration is something you cannot really reproduce. It's there, it's not there, and it comes like, when you don't think about it, and, and you cannot say, I go on with this, I stop with this. Suddenly you look in the blank wall and you say, God, what do I do now? And then you start reproducing things you did and you were comfortable with, and then you reproduce those things, and then, then you figure out you're dead. You know? Because once you reproduce things, then you're like a machine or something. And, and the point is like that, that I was so afraid of that, that I, from the beginning, 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 I always had tried to have like at least three, at times five, uh, uh, um, ways to go, you know? The beaches, the factories, the cities, the street photography, all this kind of stuff. So I all, could always do all the four of them, and they were all mine, that's important. Like, you can do like a little bit of Helmut Newton, a little bit like this, a little bit like this, that is a fake, you know? And that is really great. And then sometimes one thing falls off the wagon and you still have three left. You know? And I have friends, photographers, really brilliant photographers, and they get stuck in that problem. You know? So they have that one thing and it's wonderful, one of the best photographers in the world. And at one point he wanted to get out of this and I witnessed that because I'm friend with him and he didn't. Everything else he tried try to do was something what didn't develop there was something like he said, what can I get out of here? So why do I do this? And that you can't do because it has to come really from somewhere to be your own. No? And when you do that, then, then, then his problem was so bad that he, his agent tried, he has my agent there, this one, the white shirt. And his agent tried to say, get out of the street. That is the way. And then he did. And the pictures were even not too bad, but it was not him. No? And that is incredible. That's like when you get old and you have a house for 20 years in a place and that's where you go. Or oh, you're old and you say, okay, let's buy a house, darling. And then you buy a house in Miami and we no, don't know anybody and you be unhappy and look stupid. No? So that's happened. But also in, in terms of uh, fashion, uh, you don't attend fashion shows on purpose not to follow the trends because your work is reference free in a way. It's your own universe and you bring the work, even if you have great admiration for the talent of fashion designers, you translate it in your own world. It's not about following uh, t the trends. If camouflage is trendy, you'll do a camouflage story. I'm, af I'm afraid to be inspired from things who, ha who are forced to change every six months, no? because um, that's not you, Rhythm. That Rhythm is imposed by commercial interests, and then you're like, uh, uh, the poor guys, they have to do that every six months to create something really incredible, and they do. But if you're not that fast, and you, you only find something really, what you think you did or you found and you, you express, and that this takes eight months, you can't, you have to do it in six months, no? So, and that is machine, no? And, and I don't want to go in that machine because there's no reason for it. Well, um, what triggers you the most in the fashion industry? And uh, what's your opinion about my uh, photos that I made and my designs? <laughs> he caught me. <laughs> That's why I'm sitting here. <laughs> so, Quint, thank you very much. It was very nice to get you. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, let me start from here. How do I get out of this? <laughs> what are you thinking, for example? <laughs> no, no. Quint, I can't say anything about fashion, I have to say. No? Well, I like the drawings very much. I like the pictures. Um, a little bit less. Not that bad. Don't let me lose it. But that's that, that whole thing about you, which when, I, when we saw that, we said, 
See, that is someone who laughs that fashion. Yeah. They laughs that. And, that, and you just came out with your pants and down the way. And I said, incredible, that is exactly him, no? You could have never been this, for example, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah you see that directly. Is, that is great. So as long as it's, it's identical with you, because if you, I don't want to like that the great picture is not a great picture at this point, but I would say, um, as long as whatever you do is your own, that is the, the rule number one, not to be successful, because you're going to be successful and be really bad too, but that is something then you can reproduce all the time something which is always you, once you get to the point, no? So, and that is great. And when I see you and when I see this, that's very, very much looks like that, no? So that you're not trying to do, to do this while looking like me, no? Because that would be strange, we'd say, what's this guy's problem, no? And that's really, that's fantastic, that's very nice, no? And then, and then once you have that point and you can take it from there, you can, reproduce and reproduce and reproduce for, forever in a way, no? And once you look outside at things, what other people do, and then you go and say, wow, let me do this, this is great what he did, I do that too, no? That's very different because then you last one season or two and then you don't know what to do anymore, and then you look to so the next season what the other people do, so you never come to that point, no? And that was good. Look, for example, great example is Astin, Araya, no? Mm -hmm. So Astin was always Astin, he never did anything else. And it's fantastic, no? It's really, yeah. he's like an artist, no? He's not doing anything. He refused the whole fashion system, no? Mm -hmm. He's doing his stuff. He doesn't do the shows. When other people do the shows. Um, so he stayed that person, no? So then you can be identical with the Astin he is, no? And that's why he never does anything bad, no? Mm. I've never seen anything from him which was not brilliant, no? Yeah. And to other people then, after you get to a big fashion house, buys you and, and pays you a lot of money and then you have to half go to their style and have to another style and then you have to adapt a bit and then you got to go more there this season because they all do this. So then you become a different person, probably more successful but less real, no? Amen. Hmm? You don't need to know Thank more, you. No? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, thanks. Thank you very much. Thank Quint. You. Great. Thank, Thank you, you Quint. <laughs> Um, one thing that is really important for me about the subject uh, of the exhibition and about uh, Peter's vision that I want to share um, with you is really uh, how, in fact, he portrays people and, you know, the connection he has with uh, his subject, but also uh, how, you know, in the time now you look at magazines and you have these actresses on the cover and they have to write the name because they're so photoshopped that you don't even recognize them. And Peter, who's not very fond of, of uh, Photoshop and retouching, as you probably know. Certainly not faces. No. <laughs> um, you said one day, uh, and it's quite interesting, that uh, you, know, you were against that terror of youth and perfection. Can you explain what your vision of, of uh, retouching? Yeah, and yeah that, that starts mm -hmm. earlier. It starts with uh, every time has his, its beauty, no? And, and the, 1400, they look different than today, you know? And, and so, before there were the painters who documented that, and they were paid by the, by the authorities who ordered them the pictures, so that was a big fake, I guess, too. And today is different, no? Today is like the beauty, the ideal of beauty has been produced from, by commercial reason. It's not, what, what we see as beautiful in the magazines and everywhere, it's like, a, it's a, a crime, no? And, and why is that? That's because this is something you can make money. So big companies can make money. It's nothing wrong about this, but it's just not beautiful, no? It's beautiful, it has no truth, it has nothing, and it's retouched, all the experiences are gone, and then they put it on the wall and said, this is beautiful and perfect, and you have to be like this. And if not, you're old and ugly. So better get yourself in the shop and buy these things. And that's unacceptable, no? And there's a beauty. I just did something, the Pirelli calendar, which is not always the most nicest example for femininity. But um, we did only portraits from very known and emotional and intelligent women. They were most all actresses. And the idea was like to show 
a, a beauty which has nothing to do with the beauty what people tell you it's beautiful. So they were really raw and really sensible. And I think beauty, we have to go back to that point that beauty is something personal. No? And the moment you think, I am the way I am, and that's, that's it, nobody can make a dime on you. No? Because they can't sell you anything. That's the whole point of what the beauty image today, what's beautiful. And that's going to change. I mean, it's my little, my little war. On beauty. I think, uh, I'm sure that some of you have a question. Do you? Only one, two, three, four, five, six. Good. You want to, um, yeah? Tell me, you look so good. That's <laughs> <laughs> true. Not anymore because I'm going to show pictures. How does this work? Yeah, put some images. Can you stand, please? Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Anniette, and I'm studying at Aki in Enschede, and I'm uh, studying cross-media design. And I was wondering, uh, the story you tell and how you work is very personal. You have make a personal connection to somebody you're portraying. And it sounds very... Um, um, like it's free work, in free work, free portraits, you also would make a very personal connection. Did you find that way of working in fashion photography or did you learn that before to make a connection to somebody you portrayed? That's a really great, fresh, fabulous question that I can't really answer because I'm supposed to be a fashion photographer, officially, and um, I don't really feel like it because the fashion is not what interests me. So what interests me is what is in the fashion, and that's called woman, no? And that is really much more interesting than fashion, from, than to me. And uh, said, once said this, it's like, I, did you ask me if I feel free? Well, no, but I'm, I'm wondering why you chose fashion as a, like, form. Because there was, there was nothing else that. to do when I started this, like, 45 years, a long time. 45 years ago, imagine how long that is. So there was no much other photography. Well, it could have been a war photographer. Well, I don't like wars. And I don't think I have to go there to... to mm, no, I wouldn't be the person with that. And... I don't know what to say. <laughs> I don't know. You ask me what you want to know again. Well, um, when I hear the way you're working and your no. thought process about connecting to somebody and making a great portrait, it, it sounds uh, to me really like uh, uh, somebody who just makes portraits. The thought behind it to open yourself up and create something yeah. is not especially photography for in fashion. Yeah. So that's very interesting to me to combine those things. Okay, oh, yeah, okay. So that, that is because the fashion is not interesting it's not the main interest in the picture. So when I do the portrait of someone, I really don't care what she's dressed wearing, you know? Except it's like really exaggerated and that, that, that kills the simplicity. But it's always that, it's always that person that interests me, never the fashion. It can, it can happen that fashion is interesting, but it's not the same thing. It's, it's, it feels like something from outside. Why when you, when you take care of this, that's very exciting and personal and can, and can you call it fashion photography? That's a great discussion, no? So because someone said about my pictures, an editor from the Italian Vogue, editor-in-chief said, said um, he's not a fashion photographer. Well, I would not refuse because that would be like pretentious. He is not a fashion photographer. He doesn't care for fashion. He is talking about women with his pictures and with women, no? And that I could sign. That's Franca Sozzani, you know who that is? It's the editor of Italian Vogue, quite brilliant person. Thank you. That was an answer? Yeah. Good. <laughs> uh, hi, uh, my name is Arif. I'm studying advertising and then changing to audiovisual. And I'm very interesting, uh, the moment you tell us that you you, you move also uh, from one uh, field to another. Have you ever feel lost and how to snap out from that? And that was the first question. And the second question is, um, 
you, you also uh, underline the idea of like, if you make something, make it yours. And how to keep telling yourself like, how to make it yours and not the others, and how to um, diminish the fear of like, what if other people doesn't like it and stuff. Because in a way, um, in a way we, yeah, half of it we make it to for, it also feed energy to see that people like what you make. And of course, like the moment you come here into to the Kunsthal and then see your own photos, it's also feeding energy to make for the next project possibly, so yeah. I only came here, I only came here because Emily and, and he, they forced me to come here. Yeah? <laughs> Otherwise I would sit probably anywhere else now. <laughs> so once here, you have to know why, you know? That's true. And when you say lost, of course I'm lost. You know, I, I was like, um, 65 years I bite my nails, no? And a lot of, I see a lot of people who bite nails then, and that's very interesting because they are, the insecurity, you know, you're insecure with things you don't really know, you never have the real answers, but you're always working on something but you don't know, and you're lost, but that doesn't mean you're lost, lost, no? Because lost can also be a state of, of creating something what you don't know the end is, no? And so it's great to be lost if you not get really lost, no? But kind of lost is very healthy. That's what's the first question, no? I don't even think that I know what the second was. What? <laughs> <laughs> so the second was, if you, if you just short, yeah. say what the second was. What How to keep, uh, you make it for yourself? Keep up. How, how to make it, make it uh, how to keep make for yourself and not for others? Keep, keep creating for yourself and not for others. That's very easy and very interesting. I feel that I said it already, but it's just like um, you start doing something, successful, not successful, all that doesn't matter. And, and, then, and then you feel you come to something which is identical with you. And, and you get the inspiration. Did you read this text? There was a little text about creativity. And that was one time I was in the Modern Art Museum and I came back and I was sitting in the hotel and I said, you're not going out of this room before you write down where, what, what my idea is, where everything comes from. No? It's a very tough uh, um, um, task. And so I wrote it down like a child. No? It's very, very easy, very simple word by word. And, and a few weeks ago, it was in Athens, and we had like a, an, an evening like this. And before that, I wanted to wamp this up a little bit to make it shorter, better, and change things. No? And I figured out I couldn't take one word away. No? And, and that is exactly what I think is where creativity comes from no? and what it is. No? And if you all have that, did you all get the copy? Yes. Wow, that organization. Uh, uh, that is, if you read that, then I don't have to talk any longer because that's, I wouldn't say it better than it's written there. No, because that is really the interesting thing is like you get to yourself and you don't look around. I figured out one time I did before, I did what everybody does hmm, in, in, the, in, in Düsseldorf, in the magazines, when I was doing some jobs in the beginning, beginning, I had a big archive of shells and ripped everything out of the magazines. Oh, this is for this kind of thing, this is for this style. And I figured out quite early, when, you, when I had a job on, on Monday, Tuesday to do, that I went to this archive and I had a vague idea and I went to this archive and I started looking at all these pictures. Like three hours later, I had no clue anymore and my head was like full of everything. I had no clue anymore what to do. And I figured out that the best thing, if you want to do something, and if creating something, I mean, it's a big word, I do two pictures you for next week, you sit down and you think what I'm going to do and why, no? And then you write five words on a paper and then you have it, no? And, and I figured this out, and that was the, 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 that is what is written on this paper. You go to that place, it's yours, and then come back with something. And once you have that open, then you can go on forever. No? There's no limits because you're not you're independent. You're not dependent on information. You're not dependent on, on what, what other people do. And that's the most comfortable, comfortable thing. And I can tell you, like, we're doing a lot of things and it's very, very rarely, I think, not to say never, that sounds too pretentious, 
it's happening yet. You sit there and say, oh God, 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 what do I do? Because you can always, you have the whole world is yours, no? and you just take it and put it in and bring it out. No? That is like the most easy thing and the most, it's like, it's great. Don't look anywhere, no? just think about it. He's not going to my knee, that means you're really late. No, but there's so many questions in the back. Okay, someone in the back. Now. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Rosa, I'm from uh, the Willem de Koning and I study advertising. And we have this assignment where we have to create a brand for ourselves to sell ourselves to the creative industry. And I was wondering if you see yourself as a brand and if you could describe it. Because I don't see myself as a brand yet, so. Uh, you really have the balls to ask me if I'm a whore. <laughs> 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 yes, I am. Sometimes. Because I have a nice car. And, um, yeah, Instagram, a nice car, a nice house, even two. Beautiful apartment in Paris. Um, but no money on the bank, but still that's already enough. So I'm a whore. Sometimes, no? No, I no no I no no I don't I don't no I don't consider myself a brand. I consider myself something I can change every day without asking anybody, and pretty much free in that context. No, so I don't think I have to tell somebody what to do next week, even if they ask me to work for them, and I can still surprise them and do something they really didn't think of and if they like it or they don't like it, normally they like it because then you have another chance next year, no? And, but I never think um, I'm a brand and I have to behave that way or when I'm in public I should sit straight because my brand is like a nice guy who sits straight and everything. That is kind of a, a great piece, of, I mean a great feeling of freedom not to be a brand because a brand has obligations, no? So I be, I be, I'm an unbrand, and I get the question wrong at the beginning because I have my ears closed, so I, that's why I'm lis not listening so perfect to all the questions. No? And, and the first thing, you go back to the who thing, that was like, um, sometimes you get stuck in a situation where you only can get out with the minimal damage if you adapt yourself to the situation. The other word for this is intelligence. No? And that you're in a situation where you're not insisting to be what you want to be, but you can make little adjustments to the right or to the left, to not to hurt other people or not to get somebody losing his job because you're an idiot uh, with a principle. So all these kind of things that they make you a free man or like a less free man. But does that make any sense? Because I have a speciality, even my jokes, especially my jokes, is whatever I say, everybody laughs, but nobody gets a joke, no? So, like, <laughs> so, Thank you. I hope this has not happened too much now. Well, Sandrine is laughing, that's fine, good sign. Thank you. We have one last question, maybe I should... Oh. But there is, there is a tree. How, how are you going to do this? That's good to see, you can learn from this. Five hands and one question. Thanks, uh, Peter, for being so honest and so open. My name is Andres Pardo. I'm a story here in Amsterdam by the Photo Academy. Uh, what strikes me from you is that you're uh, vulnerable and honest, or, and you're just yourself. And that's actually quite a contradiction with where you work in the fashion industry, which for me is full of egos. So I'm thinking of how do you connect with somebody I don't like this, big supermodels, and go through that surface, uh, to, to, through the skin to get to, to really photograph the person, because you, I don't know if, if a, a supermodel comes to you and say, Peter, would you like to take my picture? Uh, then there is a big uh, image that has to be kept. 
and how do you actually are able to dismantle that, that ego that's there from that model and get the picture that you want? Yeah, if she wants my picture, then she cannot get hers. No? That's the first point. Yeah. And then the second is like, I have one quality. I mean, it's not like born, I'm not born with this, I have to say, but it became like this. I really have seen so many things that nothing, nothing, really nothing can impress me in a way that I get like, I don't know what to do anymore or something like that, no? And that is a very great weapon, no? So it, with this you're really much, much stronger. And at the end, I also don't care what you think about me. But that is pretty much a lie, no? Because I do, I like that people like me. But um, not to the point that I would do something which I'm not or what I would not be at all just because you like me, no? So that's, I could go a little bit to there, a little bit to there, mm -hmm. to see you smiling and, well, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I know. And vulnerable, I mean, all these poor people who cannot be vulnerable, I mean, that is like a level you don't even want to talk about, no? Because these poor kids, no? That must be awful, they can't even live without being vulnerable, no? I mean, it's so nice. I mean, you see, you show that, no? Then you get the same thing from other people, no? And mm -hmm. that is very important in, in, in what, we, what we said about portrait photography. So that you be really honest. I mean, honest, honest, no? And with no tricks and no positioning yourself to this or that side. No? You just be there and you like them, no? And then you get everything, no? And that's probably the only reason why I have a kind of a little talent for this, obviously. That is the only reason why the pictures might sometimes look different, because people give you something different, no? But you don't want to take it, you just let them give it to you, and if they don't give it to you, then you're not upset either, no? So all that is like a whole kind of, um, a whole system of emotions and, and positioning and all these kind of things, no? Vulnerable, not vulnerable, but I've never met anybody strong who is not vulnerable. No? But my, I have, my very close friend is, is a director I call Wim Wenders, no? and Wim is so sensible and so vulnerable, but he's not weak. That's not the same thing. People always mix that up, weak and vulnerable. No? And he is the strongest person I know, no? and he looks to like a normal person. My God, he's so shy. No? So, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Thanks. So what? Just, just one last thing that would be interesting. I guess you've all seen the, the lead image, which is plastered all over the Netherlands and mostly in Rotterdam of the new uh, the exhibition book. Um, it's quite interesting. Maybe you can tell about the story of this uh, shooting with Kate, because you saw an interview with her that was quite revealing about your ah, work. That's, that's, yeah. That was like, I, I, I saw in Nick Knight's um, show, studio. show studio, his TV channel about fashion and, and all these kind of things. I saw somebody sent me like an interview with, with uh, uh, Kate did with Nick, and she was saying, Oh, you know, Peter, really, I become a model because Peter did these pictures with Linda, and they are so amazing, and I was so impressed, and that was why, because of, that was because I became a model. I didn't know that before, also I know it for years. And, and, then, and then she said, and you know why? Because he did so serious pictures with said There was such a relationship between them, no? And, and when we worked together, we did nice pictures, but I don't feel the same thing in our pictures, but I see when I see those ones from Linda and Peter, no? And so I was working with her in like 10 days anyway for something. And so we called her and said, hey, you want to be taken serious and just take a day off after our shoot and we do something together, no? For us, no? And we did for Italian Vogue a story, like maybe 30 pages, 25 pages, something like this. And she had a break like a few months she was like took it a little easy and has changed in that time it really became a different Kate no? and, and we did these pictures with her and they were wonderful and serious and beautiful and all different 
And that was from this series, but that was more like a joke, no? Um, we just said about, oh, Teddy Boy, you know? That was the Teddy Boy, you know? And all the others is very different, and they are so emotional, and Kate looks so fantastic in these pictures. I'm really wonderful, and she laughed these pictures too, and finally felt taken serious by some old German. <laughs> no, that's what happened. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. We're sorry, but no more questions. You but you can come to see Peter. Buy this in the museum shop, <laughs> by the way. And all this too, by the way. So. <laughs> yeah, it's true. They did the, the same Someone caps <laughs> than, uh, than Peter. Someone had a funny idea to reproduce me in parts. So, <laughs> so I hope you're all going to come uh, visit the exhibition and that you're going to enjoy the work of Peter. Thank you all for coming, submitting your portfolios. It was fun. Yeah. One second, one second. This is Emily Andenk, the director from the museum, and she dragged us over here. <laughs> that's, that's why we're here. <laughs> <laughs>